Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Dr. Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. In today's podcast, I'm in conversation with Jodie Smitten, an expert in autism, and we explore the question, what is autistic masking and why does it matter? I think it's always a bit more powerful when people introduce themselves. So would you mind introducing yourself to my network? Who are you? What do you do? Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so I'm Jodie Smitten. Um, I am a parent, first of all, to three children. Uh, one is um, formally identified as autistic. Uh, another one's a weight and assessment. Um, secondly, I am a professional working with families in the Wiltshire area. Um, I'm an independent practitioner, so families can self-refer to me and um, sadly have to self-fund most of the time. Uh, so I've worked in the field of autism since I was 17, where I literally just got thrown in at the deep end, um, applied for a job in a um, what I thought was a, just advertised as a children's home at the time, um, went for an interview and then got invited to the to the home to sign contracts and was faced with uh, a whole bunch of children who I'd never experienced before that had complex um, medical needs and complex learning disabilities uh, so there was lots of autism in with that and um, actually a couple of the managers there I think took one look at me as this very small 17 year old and said we'll give her two weeks um, and actually I continued working there throughout my university years. I'd come back and work. And I just found the whole subject of autism fascinating and um, the different types of communication that these children were using um, really fascinating. And so that's where my interest sort of really started. Uh, I sort of, my whole jobs, my whole, my whole career has sort of been a bit of a fluke actually. I've fallen into various different jobs with um, mainly with vulnerable teenagers for a long time, youth offending teams. Um, youth engagement uh, worker role uh, and built up an amazing network of colleagues in doing that and uh, about I suppose when my eldest daughter was around five or six we started to notice that she was struggling and we started to notice that after school she was becoming quite distressed um, some of her behavior was really quite difficult for us to manage and being a psychology background, I was doing quite a lot of research as to what's going on for her. We were going to parents' evenings where, where they were literally saying she's a dream student. If I could have a whole class of her, I'd be a very happy teacher. And so something wasn't quite adding up for us. So it took me a lot of um, research uh, because she wasn't presenting in the way that I knew autism. So that didn't actually cross my mind for a really long time. Uh, I, I was looking at children, I, I was looking at possible trauma. I was very much blaming myself for a, possibly a fault with our parenting, all different things. And then I just stumbled across an article um, where she just ticks every single box, uh, a, an article about autism in girls. And um, I felt really sad, I felt really upset initially. And my husband found me quite upset and was like, but, but actually if she's autistic, surely like you're the perfect parent because you know what you're doing and I was like mm, okay so for a, for a long time we you know we sort of were gathering more evidence and we realized that yes she was autistic and we started started very much changing our approaches to how we parented her and we got her to a really good place at home uh, school was still always difficult for her and she was coming home and um, having quite big meltdowns mm -hmm. and we just realize that we need something more we were quite naive we were sort of like oh she doesn't need to be assessed because we know what we're doing so why does she need um to be formally identified and then when we did decide that she needed formally identified we had a bit of a battle so it i mean all these years from the moment we realized to um trying to get her assessed autism was so much my special interest particularly autism um with children that don't have a, a intellectual disability yeah children who don't necessarily present in a very outward manner, uh, children that mask. So children like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, it, it just, it just became my special interest. It was, I, I was literally reading, 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 
I'd naturally sort of became more independent in my work as time went on um, with a colleague who'd offered me some contracts of family support work yeah. focusing mainly on children's behaviour. So it, it, it just it just naturally flourished that word just got around that that uh, I, I could support children who were autistic or children that were struggling with behaviours. Um, I felt after some time that I needed to actually do a qualification to back up the work that I was doing and started at Sheffield Hallam University last year yeah. and I've just completed my postgraduate certificate in autism and Asperger's syndrome with Dr Luke Bearden and that's just for me given me that confidence in who I am and what I do and what I'm preaching so I feel much more confident um, supporting families advocating for families and children um, and here I am you are indeed and I have to rewind slightly to like right at the beginning when you described who you were and your face told a million stories when you used the word professional about yourself and you dismissed yourself entirely in the way that you said it tell me more about that what, what this feels like there's an uncertainty here um yeah I suppose I, I've been questioned I, I've been questioned by um professionals who I deem to be uh, have a higher status, I suppose, Senkos, um, head teachers about the work that I'm doing. Um, I think I'm trying to put a very different view out there of things. And I think some people find that quite difficult. Um, I suppose sometimes I'm going into schools advocating for a child and asking for things that aren't the mainstream, that aren't the norm. Mm -hmm that go against the policy sometimes so like what what kind of things are you advocating no, so, th so things so things like okay well this child shouldn't be made to sit in assemblies because they can't process that much information they find it incredibly com uncomfortable sat on a hard floor cross-legged um they are really distressed by the the feeling of the touch of somebody close by yeah. um so they're not actually taking anything in anyway so what's the point of them being sat in assembly other than you know, the only result is no learning and additional stress. So, you know, basically saying this child needs something different, yeah. um, going against the grain, sometimes produces a bit of backlash. Is that because everyone's all about inclusion and wanting children to access everything? Or what's the, what's the... I don't know. I, I don't know whether it's more about... I, I mean, I've actually had it said to me when I've talked about um, particular children that I'm working with needing a bespoke curriculum so I talked a little bit about autistic children needing um, a different a, additional emotional uh, curriculum as part of their mainstream education and I was actually told by Senko but this is a mainstream school which was shocking um, so it's maybe it's because some schools have got large numbers of stu students so they haven't got the resource for one child to be out if everybody else is in yeah. um you know most of the time it, it does boil down to resources and funding and is I this because you're working with children who are perhaps masking and you know that was the the whole kind of reason for coming into this conversation was about you know autistics who mask um so i mean that it's particularly difficult for the children that mask to get these adjustments because in the eyes of the people that see them in school they don't have they don't have um, any difficulties. So why would you put adjustments in for a child that doesn't have any difficulties? So, so let's just comes... let's just define masking a moment. I'm just aware not everyone will know what we're talking about. So let's do that and then I will pick back up. Okay. So um, masking is the, uh, I feel like there's two aspects of it. So part of it is the suppression of distress, which is what I see a lot in the ch children I work with. So. The suppression of that difficult emotion where they just hold it all in um, if the lights are too bright in school if they're distressed through noise or through friendship difficulties whereas some children will outwardly say I'm finding this tricky or um, for children that mask they won't they won't uh, express that mm -hmm. but then there's also the social camouflaging aspect of masking where children will put on a performance and act to basically try and fit in with their peers or with whatever group they're amongst so they will mimic people around them they might they might copy 
mannerisms, speech. I work with lots of children that very easily pick up accents of people around them. So they might start to mimic a particular accent of somebody they're spending a lot of time with. Uh, we know that all children have a desire to be like their friends and fit in at a certain age. Uh, but actually for these children, it's a whole nother level. It's, um, it's a constant um, focus on what's going on around them and ensuring that they blend into that and ensuring that they're not in any way standing out from the crowds. So um, it's exhausting and it's constant. Why is it exhausting? Because they're constantly trying to um, concentrate on the, the people around them. They're constantly trying to work out the communication they're trying to work out what they should be saying next to fit in with the crowd they might be really focusing on um what other people are saying and trying to mimic that so it's very difficult and, and at the same time they're also trying to keep up with the conversation yeah. so if a, a, a group of peers are talking about football they're trying to figure out what everybody else is saying so that they, that they can mimic that but also learn from the conversation as well so they can fit in better next time uh, so it's it's exhausting. It, it's it's tiring. It's constant. Um, and also, if we if we put that together with the suppression of emotions, yeah. they're not actually able to say, "I'm finding this really tricky." Could you just talk one at a time? Or actually, the wind's blowing on my face, and that makes it really difficult for me to follow any of this. Yeah. Uh, or actually, I'm freezing cold, and I don't like standing outside at playtime. So there's so many, there's so many dark dimensions that are really um, playing against each other and making it particularly difficult for an autistic child. And this is something that you've obviously done quite a bit of, of research about and, and written about, and it's really sparked the interest within my network, which is why I couldn't wait to, to talk to you about it. And I wondered, obviously, I think you said that your um, blog post that you wrote about it, which um, lots of people have read, and I think you said that was based on a, a longer piece of work your research and um, how did you how did you decide what you needed to share more widely what people needed to know and what were you hoping to achieve when you put that piece of work out there uh, so I I'm quite passionate about the concept of mask and being out there because for me I work with many many children that are uh, traumaed from their experiences mm -hmm. um, of masking and also then that obviously leads on to needs not being met. I work with children that are going to be on incredibly long journeys to overcome some of that mistrust in adults around them, um, to overcome some of the trauma that that's caused. Uh, I work with children who at very young ages are suicidal, who are self-harming. Um, they have the most incredible families that are supporting them and supporting their needs. But for six hours a day, they are going into an environment that very much goes against their neurology. So it's the school's and, fault? Sorry? School's fault? Not necessarily. You know, I, I think actually not even not necessarily a lot of the time no um it's so there's various different again various different dimensions of it there's there's not enough training there's not enough compulsory tra training in my opinion for teachers um around autism in general but particularly around masking in fact i i I don't know of any particular training around masking. I put it into all of my um, webinars because I think it's important, but I'm not sure there's anything specific about masking. Would you uh, run? Sorry? Would you, so just, just an aside, everyone just, just hang on a moment. So <laughs> would you be happy to run some? Uh, you know, would you run some live webinars on, on masking if people were interested in learning more yeah, and, and using that to inform their practice? yeah most definitely and what what do you know what what does that kind of look like what do people need to know because there will be people watching this saying gosh maybe i have unintentionally caused trauma and there are children here you said there are children self-harming or who are suicidal because of trauma they've experienced which is presumably not intentional it's just no. sort of getting it wrong um so what yeah so what do they need to do so firstly they need to 
listen and believe parents. Um, the, the most common thread through all of the messages and emails and comments that I've received from parents is that we've tried. We've tried speaking to the GP, we've tried speaking to school. School say it's a problem at home because they're not seeing anything there. Um, we've been put on parenting courses that aren't appropriate for supporting an autistic child. Um, so firstly, it's, about, it's just about having that trust in relationship between schools and parents and also the parents, um, schools need to bear in mind that if they are dealing with a possibly autistic child, they're also working alongside a possibly autistic adult. So they need to be aware of the differences in how that parent communicates and, um, and that that can sometimes be misconstrued as a neurotic, neurotic over anxious parent. Um, and actually having a child who is really struggling at home that isn't having their needs met in school causes a parent to become quite anxious yeah. so it's it's being aware of that it's being aware that if a parent is coming to you saying this is how my child is presenting at home being curious being non-judgmental about that having um so so quite often as part of what i do with families is i'll go in and do observations in schools on a child and um having one set of eyes on a child for a period of time mm. is so insightful just being able to have that whole focus a, a teacher's unable to do that she's got a class of 30 plus um it might be that she's missing some of those signs that a child is struggling uh, if if they're masking it might be that the signs are really really subtle it might be that the signs aren't even there um it might be that the child has has learnt to only be um showing some of those stimming distressing uh, signs of distress behaviors when the teacher's not looking so for example i see children that are constantly swinging their legs under the table or the children that are constantly needing to sharpen their pencil just to get up and move to regulate themselves um children that are always asking to go to the loo at, at inconvenient times of the day um children that are constantly biting their nails twiddling their hair so lots of these are stimmed can you yeah. explain stimming for anyone who might not know so a self-stimulatory behavior is a, a behavior that a child or, or an adult uses to regulate themselves to help themselves feel calmer so actually all, all people stim to some level we all might sit and bite our nails from time to time or uh, play with a pen or um for autistic children, there's this stereotypical looking stim. So that's that, that child that maybe jumps and flaps. Mm -hmm. um, for a child that masks or for a child that's less outward in their autism presentation, those signs can be a lot more subtle. Some of them can be very, very typically looking. So like I said about the child that sits twiddling with their hair mm -hmm. or the child that sits playing with a pen. So this is why it's important to listen to parents because it's almost piecing together the various different um, bits that are being seen in different areas. And what does that, what does that look like when you put that all together, when you bring all that information together? It's, and, and actually another thing to mention, important to mention is that sometimes children mask everywhere. So I've worked with parents who um have come to me concerned about their child's anxiety that seem to have come out of nowhere yeah. and what we actually have discovered is that that child has been masking throughout their whole life at home and at school wow. and the pressure and the exhaustion has got so much that they then hit a brick wall and then everything falls apart very very suddenly um and it's almost like it's just come out of nowhere but actually it's been sitting under the surface for a really really long time yeah. and nobody's noticed it and uh, that is really, obviously really difficult for a family it's really difficult for parents to um, get their head around that and come to terms with that so it's not just in school that children mask it's it can be anywhere it can be out and about it can be at parties it can be at sleepovers it can be on play dates it can be in the park do they know uh, they're doing it? Um, for most of the children that I work with, it seems to be quite instinctive and subconscious, but actually, so some of the older children that I work with, 
are actually able to show um when you really unpick it and explore it with them they are able to say well this is what i would do at home but this is what i would do at school so i quite often do an activity with children where we talk about um how you what you might be doing or how you might be behaving or what you might look like if you were angry sad happy excited mm. and when it comes to talking about these things i always talk about home and not at home or home and school or home and with friends and these children can very much describe how they would um, respond to a trigger at home in comparison to how that might look if they were in a different setting some children are really um very good at that but wouldn't necessarily know that that's um that's never been labeled for them they've never been told oh this is because you are masking and this is why mm. and i think it's really important for the children that are able to um comprehend that for them to have that level of understanding about themselves because that's important for them managing life going forwards and why would some children mask in some situations but not others? What would lie beneath that? Um, I suppose some children are more aware. So some children are more aware of um, their differences. Some children are more inclined to want to fit in. Yeah. They, 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 want, they want to be... Um, yeah, they just they just want to fit in they want to blend some children i work with have quite high levels of social anxiety mm -hmm. so they will be fearful of any responses that they get sometimes this has been brought on by responses that they've had in the past so maybe they've they've um jumped and flapped in the past and somebody's made a, a comment and said oh well, what are you doing or, or or laughed or and so that brings about the social anxiety um so some of it is about early early experiences and actually i think i wrote about it in my blog how actually adults are, are not brilliant at not responding positively to differences you know um and i talked about my son who's who's got really long hair and the amount of comments that he's had about his long hair well you need to go and get your hair cut you look like a girl and um, and that actually for when it's family members now i tell them off and i say stop saying that to him um, He's petrified of the hairdressers. Why should he sit through a haircut that makes him feel really distressed just because of everybody else's thoughts about how he looks? Um, mm. But actually, the more he hears that at a young age, the more he's then going to feel like, well, this is how I look is wrong in some way, or it causes me to, to receive comments and attention that I really am uncomfortable with. How do people respond when you challenge them on it? If it's family, they just know to be quiet. <laughs> but <laughs> do you think it, sorry about my cat. <laughs> do you okay. think it changes how they they actually kind of think and feel, or do they just know that well, this is a taboo? Hmm. I suppose it depends on how much um, how in depth I go. Yeah. So if I'm just to say, don't don't say that, yeah. um, then they might go a bit of a taboo. Um, if I was to say go into the the depth that i've just gone with you about how he finds it distressing then yeah it, it, it would reframe it for them and then I'm, I'm i'm i love using the word reframe reframing mm. behaviors um and differences to people in parents is massively empowering why is it empowering i mean it just it, it it just makes people look at things in a different way like one of the I quite often talk about pace. I don't know if you're aware of pace parenting and um, a lot of stuff by Dan Hughes about um, being more attuned to your child and, and the C in pace. Tell us it, them all just because so, again you have to just assume. Okay, okay. yeah. So do Google it for more information. This is going to be very brief. But pace parenting is being playful. It's being accepting of emotions and that all emotions are okay and normal and that we shouldn't try and belittle our children's emotions. We should just let them be. C is curious and E is empathy. So it's about using that um, in how you respond to your parents. But curious is the one that I constantly bang on about with all parents. I'm like, be curious. Like, don't be judgmental about your child's behavior until you really know what's going on for them. So when they're acting in a way that maybe is making you feel 
um, a bit cross or annoyed or in a way that you're thinking this is a bit strange this is a bit unusual rather than pointing that out to them be curious like what is it what is that behavior trying to communicate and I actually I've, I purposely wore this t-shirt today a little less <laughs> oh, awesome. actually it's it, it, it's just what we need to do in in our parenting and or in our teaching or whatever setting we're in we need to be curious all behavior is a form of communication all behavior has a, a function to the child so there's not just some kids are just naughty sometimes i don't think so people might not have their opinion if a child is acting outwardly there's a there's a need um maybe it's a need for connection maybe you know attention seeking i hate the term attention seeking but actually if a child's attention is seeking they need attention so it gives them some attention um i think the words attention seeking has got a real stigma attached which doesn't make any we all need yeah, attention right. sometimes, right? Yeah, child needs attention. Maybe he's going about it in the wrong way or she's going about it in the wrong way or in the wrong way in your eyes. But if that's the only way that the child knows how. And how does being curious help with this? Because it helps reframe. So if we can think, okay, let, let's think of a scenario. Um, a child that is trying to think of a really basic, simple one. A child that is refusing to eat their dinner that evening maybe it's a dinner that they might usually eat or so okay so ra rather than just assuming that that child's being difficult and we're going to battle with them about that and insist that they sit at the table and that's insist that they eat their dinner we're going to say hey what's what's going on this is something that you'd usually eat is you know what I mean, let's face it, as adults, what's, if, if we're feeling down or depressed or low or anxious, some people will just go off their food. That's the first thing that they'll do. If they're, if they're feeling unwell, they might go off their food. So as an adult, would we then want to be forced and battled into eating a meal when we're really not feeling up to it? So just being curious with your child and saying, hey, what's going on for you today? This isn't like you. Are you feeling okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? Are you feeling um unsettled sad upset cross um and just being curious about it if your child then turns around and says well actually something happened at school today and i feel really really sad then you can work through that with them they're then going to feel settled and then be able to eat their food and, and that's what you wanted to do in the first place if they turn around and say well actually i ate absolutely loads and had seconds of um pudding at lunchtime today um, in school you might go oh okay so maybe you're just not hungry so it's just about oh never assuming that a child's just being difficult or just playing up and just being curious and um, you know some children aren't able to articulate that and that that's a whole other subject and as to how we work with that but even just having that empathy and curiosity about your child can instantly make them feel more relaxed more at ease somebody's listening to me um, and enable them to then manage what it, whatever it is it's, uh, that you're asking them to do or, or manage whatever emotion it is that they're dealing with and I guess this is when you know we can be curious when we're seeing behavior that is kind of distressing or challenging or somehow different than what we'd normally expect but the whole kind of entry point for this conversation was around masking when maybe there isn't uh, particular you know it almost it's the, the absence of that behavior that we need to be more curious about but how do we do that how do how yeah I mean, th this is tricky you're saying you're saying to us basically yeah lo lo lots and lots of people are really really struggling inside and they're suppressing things and they are putting on a brave face essentially and being on their mm -hmm. best behavior and kind of pa passing as normal if you like um and there's not many signs for us to pick up on so how do we help okay so if a parent is coming to you saying that this is what they're seeing, just being aware of masking and that that could be a possibility, thinking about whether that could be a possibility. Um, and then really, if you can, get in the child's voice. So in order to get the child's true voice, they have to feel really, really safe. They have to be allowed to say things without judgment. They're allowed to say things about teachers that they wouldn't usually say without, without being told off. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be in a really, really safe place to be able to do that. Um, sometimes that needs to be somebody from outside of school. Somebody that needs, sometimes there is that one person in school that they do have that trust with. Sometimes yeah. that needs to be with a parent and um, a parent is then able to 
share with the school what the child has said, maybe through a video, maybe through, um, so quite a lot of the children that I work with, we produce a PowerPoint presentation. So we're going to do a PowerPoint presentation all about you. Wow, that's such a great school, all of the things that you love, all of the things that you're really interested in. Okay, tell school what you find difficult in school. Tell school what helps you. Because we've already done quite a lot of work up to this point around really unpicking some of the difficulties that they're having. Um, and that journey can sometimes be quite a quick one, sometimes it takes a bit longer. But, um, you know, loads of kids love to be doing things with computers, PowerPoints, and they make things come whizzing in and they find pictures on Google Images of their special interests and, you know, cover the whole presentation in dogs or Lego or whatever it is that they really love. Um, and then we simply email it to the school and we simply say, can this be emailed around every single teacher that comes into contact with this child? This is what the child wants you to know. And it's done in the child's language, it's done in the child's voice, um, and it's believed. And it's like, okay, we didn't know this was going on for you. Thank you for telling us. Thank you for um, sharing this with us. We can, we can use this to help you. And actually, one of the things that's really nice about that is for the child um, to be able to provide that information it actually lessens their anxiety so it makes them instantly feel safer about going into that environment okay. and that they find tricky because they're like actually this person knows about me now I was never able to verbalize that I was finding this finding this difficult um, but now that they know I instantly feel better is there um, no concern that if they've been masking whether that's consciously or subconsciously for all that time I mean Seemingly they've been doing that for a reason like is it not scary for them to kind of come out if you like about the way they're thinking and feeling massively scary sometimes um we do that piece of work over a really long period of time and sometimes we might only ever share that piece of work with one special person within school the person that they feel most safe with um so, so maybe that's a ta or a particular teacher or whoever that may be um it is, you know, and it's not a piece of work done in isolation. So we might do lots of work around that, around um, building self-esteem, becoming more aware of their autistic identity and feeling positive about that. Some people might, some children might choose to, to initially share it just with a friend mm. um, before it goes any further. It's not a, there's no magic wand quick fix. It, it's always dependent on the child and where they're at and how they feel. But I think it's it's so helpful if, if the school receive that information and then act upon it yeah. and um, validate it because then that instantly goes okay they've listened they've really listened and they're, and, and they're gonna respond to that um, so do we need to do work around preparing people to respond appropriately to make sure it is well received or does it um it's something i would like to do okay. um it it's it's about building a good relationship with a school and i do have that relationship with some schools um not so much others it but actually you have to like i always whenever i start working with a family i always say my gold standard is to work with you to work with your child and to work with your child's school because actually we could do loads of work at home we could we could really change the way that you respond we could make sure that she's getting lots of decompression time and sensory breaks and but actually if school aren't on board you've still got a child that's coming out of that situation highly stressed and, and inevitably at some point will melt down and is it sometimes the other way around is it sometimes that school is on board and there's maybe someone there who really gets it and at home are less attuned to it or um i suppose in in my in with my caseload no because parents come to me and they self refer because you're commissioned I, by parents so yes. yes so i suppose that could be different in um some cases some cases i suppose I might go into a family and mum's contacted me or dad's contacted me and the other parent isn't quite on the same page. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes we do a bit of work around trying to um, bring parents together to um, ensure that everybody is on the, on the same page again, that, that depends on the family and where they are in their journey. and. And you mentioned earlier in the conversation that if you're working with an autistic child that you might be working with autistic parents. Say more about that. 
Yeah, so I mean, th there's a genetic link with autism. Um, so I, I very rarely um, meet an autistic child where one of the parents um, isn't possibly autistic or can relate to the child in, their child in some way. Um, I actually find that quite helpful uh, if a parent says to me, well, I can see why he's struggling with that because um, I struggle with X, Y, Z. Um, and I think I've got uh, possibly traits. Sometimes parents recognise that, sometimes they don't. And I and I'm just like, well, actually, that's brilliant because because you're coming from a place of understanding straight away. You know, maybe your child presents differently to you in terms of their strengths and difficulties lie in different areas, but you have got a really amazing relatedness to your child, which means that you can really start to think about how your child may be feeling and um, expressing themselves in different situations. So it's actually a strength having an autistic parent of an autistic child rather than just a challenge. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't view it as a challenge at all, okay. at all. It's, it's an interesting journey to go on. If you, if I'm working with a family um, for a period of time, um, that as you start to have more and more conversations with a parent, yeah. You, you you start to see the similarities and you can see that they're starting to see the similarities and it's some you know with many parents i've got to the point where they've gone to me do you think i might be autistic and i'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're ready to have that conversation yeah um, and i'm and i'm <laughs> so you don't, you don't deny them of that knowledge wait for them to yeah i mean it's, you, you have to judge it some people um have to come to that conclusion themselves other parents i i work with straight away and they'll say to me do you think i could be autistic um, and then we might have a discussion around that yeah uh so i yeah i mean i don't i don't view that as a as a challenge at all and do you encourage them to go and actually kind of seek a formal diagnosis and stuff if that's the case or do you just work with them as if autistic and yeah i mean I just work with everybody as to where they are, really, um, autistic or not. But some parents might say to me, I would like a formal assessment and I can talk to them about the various routes. Yeah. Um, some people will say to me, do you think it's important for me to have um, my autism formally identified? Um, and we might talk through that. I think it's, you know, some, some parents will ask me about their child and their child having assessments and, and yeah. you know, so many parents feel like they don't want to label their child, and which I, I really do try and get them again to reframe because actually you're not labelling your child, you're giving your child an identity, you're giving your child an understanding of themselves and you're giving your child access to a whole tribe of people that can make her feel welcome and supported and um and understand themselves so much better and quite often children that i work with at mask have already labeled themselves they've labeled themselves um unsuccessful failing stupid um lazy mm. uh different but in a bad way we weird but in a bad way um so actually sometimes it's about removing those labels and giving them the correct label and and then working with them to feel really positive about that. So it sounds like part of your work is around educating people about what autism actually is and means and seeing that this isn't some kind of life sentence, but you know, I, I don't know, I, I always think that there's lots of kind of superpowers that come with autism. So it's partly about being identified, isn't it? But not only can you identify with, with people and it gives you that sense of belonging finally, when maybe you felt outside of things, but also that, um, there are real strengths. Some of the things that can make autism a challenge are also the things that make us able to achieve amazing things. You know, when I look on my own career, I think some of the things I've done, it's because I have that very black and white and determined kind of thinking and that rigidity. Yeah, it's difficult in some circumstances, but in others, it's a real gift. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's pretty much what I preach to parents um, when we're talking through um, assessments and mm -hmm. But some people uh, I, I don't, don't, don't assess now, do they? Like, it's not always standard. Some people just say, well, we'll support as if autistic, but that the process is so long and slow or expensive or what have you. So some LAs actually don't 
even kind of go there now, do they? What, what's um, no, no, it's it's difficult. I mean, technically, a, sh a child shouldn't need a formal identification to have their needs met. You mm. know, adjustments and um, support in school should be based on need. But actually, um, if you're looking at the possibility of trying to get extra funding and resource for a child, we know that having that identification, formal identification, is really powerful. Mm. It shouldn't be that way, um, but it is. It's difficult now. I mean, in our area, you're looking at a two and a half year wait for an assessment. Yeah. And wow. that, that was before lockdown. <laughs> so um, it's, it's incredibly difficult. I, I always encourage time. parents, sorry. That's a long time in a child's life, long time in anyone's. But sorry, you were gonna say you always encourage parents. I always encourage parents to attempt to get on the waiting list. Yeah. Um, sometimes at the stage that we're talking, we feel like there's maybe not quite enough evidence um, to, to warrant an um, a identification or diagnosis. But I always say, look, you're, you're on the waiting list two and a half years. If two and a, two and a half years time, we feel that actually we're barking up the wrong tree, um, which is usually unlikely, but then we just pull off the waiting list. Um, mm -hmm. If we wait two and a half years until we're pretty sure, we've then got another wait another two and a half years. So is there, um, a, 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 let me try and work out what I'm trying to say here. Right, so my thinking, so I'm thinking out loud here. Um, I work with a project called the Peace Pathway, which is about um, recognizing um, how best to support people who've got a comorbid diagnosis of um, eating disorders or mainly anorexia and autism. Um, and part of that um, project, um, what's happened is that lots of um, clinicians who are not specialists at all in, in uh, autism, but are specialists in eating disorders, um, have learned to do the kind of the, the simplified screening, so like ADOS and, and stuff like that, um, in order to try and work out which of their patients, because we know there's a high prevalence in that, that yeah. but that we're not recognising it, so that they can try and sort of, yeah, do a bit of essentially an initial screen and try and work out who might be um, benefiting from this particular treatment pathway. Um, and I just wonder if that's the sort of thing, you know, should it be that there should be someone in every school who's trained in that kind of screening, even if it doesn't give the, the full diagnosis, it gives us an idea that for this child, there's a clear likelihood. I, don't know what I, I mean, yeah, I think that would be massively helpful. Most classes that I go into, I can, I, I think the most recent statistics is one in 54 children. Um, I think I think that's a massive amount of representation. I go into a class, in most classes I go into, I see at least two children that I think would warrant an assessment. Every class? In every class. Is that because you're just looking for it? I mean, is it, do you, um, really, think, do you really think? No, I, ge I genuinely do. Um, I genuinely do. I see children that, okay, so maybe, maybe there are other conditions that present in a similar way, but either way, this child needs an assessment yeah um so i think it's i think it would it would be um a, a valid uh role within a school but i'm also very much an advocate for this child has a need who cares what it is who cares what it's called because actually even if they've got an identification of autism that doesn't ne that doesn't mean we know what their needs are no that's true that's that doesn't mean we Oh, okay well this child's autistic so here we go here's our this is what we give to autistic children <laughs> is the silver bullet yeah yeah, yeah here we go. so wow. actually why why do why do we have to wait why don't we work with this child why don't we work with these parents and help them unpick what their difficulties are and help them unpick what their strengths are and work with where the child is I think um, yeah, that's that's so important. So so what, but from what you're saying, you, you so the, the the statistics are one in fifty four, and you reckon it might be like as many as two per class. So that would suggest that maybe three and four autistic kids aren't being picked up. Yeah, but that now now you put it like that, it sounds really like a massive statement. <laughs> but, I don't, I'm quite I'm quite up for massive statements. I mean, yeah, I, I, I know that there's a huge unrecognised need there. Yeah, and I think there's so many children that are sitting under the radar. So I talked I talk briefly about some uh, a child that I spoke to. So a child in a class that I was in, um, I wasn't directly working with this child, but I'd been in the class for some time, so the children knew me quite well and um, would come and chat. 
and uh, one child that I um, got chatting to one day, we were talk I, I talked to him about if he liked school. He's like, yeah, yeah, I like school. And I was like, real. So I don't like getting ready for school. And I said, oh, do you not? Why don't you like getting ready for school? And he just, he looked at me, he looked at me and went, oh, it's just putting clothes on, isn't it? Clothes are so uncomfortable. This is a five-year-old. He had no idea that not every other person in his class find putting clothes on so uncomfortable. These are the children that are going under the radar. Um, because to him, that's, that's everybody else's experience. Um, so it's, it's children like this that, that you, that you, you just wouldn't notice. Um, and for me, early recognition of a, of a child's differences is so important. It's so important for their self-identity. It's so important for ensuring that we don't hit that brick wall. Um, and that we don't end up with anxieties around going into school or, um you know going out and about so how are we going to fix it oh jody how what are we going to do hang on hang on i need a drink of water before i answer that one <laughs> it's just pure gin isn't it <laughs> uh how are we going to fix it i mean i could provide you a five thousand word assignment about how i think it should be fixed <laughs> I, I mean personally for me if we were talking about masking and we were talking about how much it hinders um, access to support and identification of autistic children and also I should probably mention that also children with ADHD mask yeah. Yeah. Um, so if we want these children to be recognized we want these children's needs to be met then we have to masking has to be common knowledge it has to be out there it has to be out there with GPs it has to be out there with people that assess it has to be out there with teachers senkos um, you know, even parents need to know, know that this, there's an aspect of certain conditions that mean that they don't present. Yeah. Um, the, and this is one of the reasons why I actually, um, my, my Facebook page, page is called behavior support. I don't like the word behavior, but actually I have parents come to me about their children's behavior. They don't recognize that as possibly being something more. If I call myself an autism specialist, there will be a whole um, host of people that wouldn't access or wouldn't think to approach me because they don't recognise their children's behaviour as possible autism. Yeah. Or they don't recognise their child's um, after school Jekyll and Hyde phenomenon meltdowns. Mm. And they go to school and school say, no, she's fine here, he's fine here. Um, and they instantly blame their parenting. They would, you know, that's... Which you would, wouldn't you? I get asked about this all the time. Yeah, we're, Parents who are distraught, you know. Yeah. So um, I just think it needs to be common knowledge. It needs to be a common known aspect of, um, of autism. And actually having my blog um, shared around some of the most, um, I suppose, I can't think of the word, but the most reassuring comments have come from people who I know have got no experience or um, knowledge or personal contact with the autistic world and but they've read my blog and I've gone wow that's really cool that's, that's really cool. Re and I've actually thanked them for taking the time to read something that probably in their minds has no relation to anything that they do um and what are you doing? So I think, so there's a definite thing there that I would love to commission you to run a, like a, a, as a minimum, a live learning session so people can come if you were up for it and you could teach them. So we covered a lot of it today, but I think doing a more, you know, a more slightly more formal session and where people can come and interact if you were up for it would be really awesome. Um, and then I'm interested to know, have you got kind of plans? Are you writing more or what, what's next? Um, this? Okay. So a lot of my writing is actually being done at the moment alongside my daughter. So my daughter's 11. Um, she was identified last year uh, and she talks amazingly about um, masking. And in her mind, she's like, it's simple. Like, mm -hmm. this is what it is. How could anybody not get it? So she's got a YouTube channel that she talks about various different things on. Um, she's a bit flitty with it. So sometimes she puts lots on there and sometimes not. But, but we in lockdown decided to write a book um talking around talking about the different experiences 
So she talks about her experiences of different aspects of her autistic life yeah. um, and from her viewpoint. And then I talk about, uh, I talk about that a bit more in depth and how that might look like for other children yeah. um, and um, talk about the, uh, a, a deeper insight into it, I suppose. And so we've got like a, a, a piece suitable for the child and then um, a little bit more information for the adult. Yeah. Um, we would love to have it published and we have actually submitted it to JKP. So I was going to say, if JKP, yeah, I can help you with that. If there's anything <laughs> um, there's so much more that we could add to it. Um, that we, we sort of, we made a really good start on it and actually it could be a finished piece, but um, I'm sure there's so much more we could add to it. Uh, so I am, um, I, I mean, this is my first blog. I got asked by um, Libby Hill from Smart Talkers. She approached me after reading a report that I'd written for a child that we were both working with um, and said, actually, could you, would you do a guest blog? And I was like, I've never written a blog before. And she was like, oh, you know, it's quite, and um, I just went for it. So it's a bit of a shock. I think it's been read um, 8,000 times now. In, wow. It's been up since Tuesday. So, um, and I loved writing it. Uh, so I think, I mean, I really struggle writing academically. I've really, I mean, um, working, having Luke Bearden supervise me is amazing. Uh, but academic style of writing takes an awful lot for me. I it hate really it. Is I a, hate it really it. is a battle, a real a labour of love. I remember but writing my thesis and just basically having to put long words in it because that's what's expected. <laughs> I was working on two projects at the same time. I was writing for the MindEd portal, so like the online learning, um, and they wanted you to assume a reading age of about 12, so it was accessible to everybody. And I was writing my thesis at the same time, and I just happened to get feedback on both on the same day because I just generally write as me. And like one was like, you need to simplify your writing and don't put more than eight words in a sentence or something and the other one was um, we need to really add some more terminology in and I was like oh come on because actually the audience is the same it's people right and uh, yeah yeah see you in what you do and oh, I it's great in academic writing though does it <laughs> yeah but I think there's a question about reference written all over my, oh. my assignments and I go but I believe it I think it's true so why do I have to find somebody else that feels the same or that's the great thing about it? these kind of platforms you will find lots of people and yeah I guess that's it you just have to think who your audience are and what you're trying to what you're trying to achieve but yeah this is another conversation for us to make <laughs> offline I think but I would love to help and get your voice more heard but I'm okay. aware we have loads of questions submitted and I've been okay. I've asked all the questions so far so some of them have uh we've, we've maybe answered but let's do a bit of a quick fire uh, mm -hmm. on some of these questions so we had um how can secondary school staff help children who haven't had a formal diagnosis yet from Karen Kingston okay um yeah i mean i i, I suppose we've sort of answered this really we're, we're trying to meet need we're not trying to meet a uh, um identification so work with that child get her into a really trusted space um a really safe space and work with them to find out really truly what their needs are yeah so look for um, needs rather than and work alongside the parent as well so if the parent is saying actually she really struggles when we go into noisy busy places and school go well she's she seems fine well actually no don't don't expect her to go on school trips where there it's noisy and busy even mm -hmm. though she might look like she's managing um she will might need support in that area and she might need support with that trip or just um you know an, an escape route if she needs it so just don't um just work with the child and work with the parent and whatever applies at home will also apply at school even if it's not obvious yeah Excellent. Terry Culkin said, can masking be so good that young people go through well into adult life before being recognised or diagnosed as autistic? And how much damage can this cause? I mean, in short, yeah, absolutely. Look at all of the um, late diagnosed autistic adults. So, you know, there's a whole, however many missed generations of autistic adults. Yeah. Um, so, yes, definitely. Um, damage, I think... Um, I suppose that varies uh, in terms of the damage that is caused. We know that there's lots of um, misdiagnosed adults that have spent most of their adult lives within mental health services, and there's so much research on this. Uh, yeah, I mean, th there's so much misdiagnosis around um, personality disorders yeah. um, that maybe are misdiagnosed or have developed as a result of um, not having needs recognized. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so the damage can be um, incredibly uh, dis concerning. You know, we know that there's a higher prevalence of suicide rates amongst um, autistic people. It's a higher pre prevalence of um, premature death through stress and chronic health conditions. So yeah, the research is there that very clearly says that the, the damage is happening. Stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, anonymous, how many or how often are masking behaviours automatic? Um, and you're aware you're choosing to shield behind them. Oh no, sorry, or are you, basically are masking behaviours automatic or do you choose to shield behind them? We maybe answered this a little bit. But. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, I've seen masking in children as young as three. Um, I think I've actually seen an article recently that I keep meaning to go back to talking about a six month old that they think could have been doing masking behaviours, but I may have made that up. I need to check that out. Um, but yeah, for some children, it's, it's, um, very instinctive but then we have to consider whether maybe that instinctiveness comes from a survival um and it could yeah. a survival method because actually if i just blend in nobody speaks to me and i actually find social interaction really difficult mm. because people just fire random pointless questions at me yeah so oh, it's that learned behavior because you're just, you just saying about the six month old just took me straight back to um my daughter ellie when she first came to live with us so she's adopted um, and when she first joined the family, she was about six months old. And um, obviously she'd experienced a massive trauma because the one place where she'd ever been, her foster placement up till then, um, suddenly that was gone and she was with us and we you know, did everything that we could for her, but she was in a completely new home and that was hard. Um, and she was you know, deeply kind of troubled as a small baby and she's brilliant now, but it was difficult. And she spent most of her time crying and screaming and being deeply, deeply, deeply distressed at home. But you take her out, she was just a big smile and whenever anyone knew would walk into the room she was so and everyone used to say oh isn't she lovely isn't she smiley um and our kind of hypothesis around this was that she had been um living up till that point in a very busy foster home beautiful beautiful family um a lady called Anne had been an amazing carer to her um but this foster home was generally for um uh, teenagers and so there were different kids coming in and out all the time but what I kind of figured was maybe she had learned that when she smiled, when these kind of big burly teenagers walked in, that actually she got a nice response from them. And so mm -hmm. she continued to do it. I don't know. It's just always a hypothesis, but it was always really marked the difference in how she was yeah. out and about and, and with new people than yeah, with us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you can yeah. see how it can easily become a learned behavior. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Next. Um, so I think we've kind of covered this, but some local authorities and schools state they will um, not do private assessments. Oh, no, okay, so they won't do private. They'll only use an NHS diagnosis. What should parents do if faced with that? Okay, so I've been faced with this quite a bit, actually. And um, it's... Um, so there's something in the Code of Practice that um, sends special educational needs um, Code of Practice and if I remember from memory, because I, I work alongside um, a lady who's um, amazing with SEN law, and I'm sure it's page 119 of the code practice, it talks about um, how as part of the process of assessing a child's needs, mm -hmm. that all reports have to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. What's helpful is if the practitioner that you, or the clinician that assesses um, is registered with um, the body that registers or health professionals, what was it called? I can't remember. But they're registered with a professional body and that they are following nice guidelines or nice, gui yeah, nice recommendations. There's the SEN code of practice, again, it's only a, it's only a um, recommendation, it's not a, it's not a legally binding document. Um, but a really good website to look at um, is IPSEA, so I-P-S-E-A, IPSEA. They are experts um, in law and rights and um, responsibilities, and they, I know, talk a lot more about this subject. Um, it is very difficult. I, local authorities are a bit, some local authorities are a bit anti-private um, private diagnosis, private assessments, uh, in my opinion, they shouldn't be. 
I was going to say, if there's a two and a half year waiting list and you can afford exactly. to go down the private route, why would you not do that for your child? Um, and they're even in the waiting list for the people that are then not able to, to mm. access a private route. So, um, yeah, just make sure that the clinician that you're using is, you know, or the, the team of clinicians that you use are um, professionally registered and yeah. Yeah. with the right level of qualifications most of the most of the private clinicians now have worked within the nhs and then then gone private they've worked within the nhs for years and years mm -hmm. so you would hope that they would be recognized but i know that it is can be difficult but, uh, my daughter has a um private uh diagnosis and if anybody tried to argue it i would probably hit the roof um because it's a very valid um, and robust assessment and, and a fantastic report. Yeah. So it's about really, it's, it's about really being really confident about your child's um, assessment, mm. but then also having a little bit of law and a, a few yeah. um, policies to back you up a little bit to support you. But I, exactly. um, as far as I'm aware, particularly throughout the statutory assessment process for an EHCP, I'm pretty sure that the board have to look at ev everything that's submitted, doesn't matter where it's come from. That's really helpful. And then um, there's a good question here, which actually talks to something we mentioned earlier. So um, this is one saying, someone saying, as a primary school SENCO, so special needs coordinator, um, I find it difficult to talk to parents about their child possibly having autism when they have no concerns. What would your advice be? Um, I would probably go, uh, probably start off with talking about the child's needs, um, necess not necessarily talk about the autism, but mm -hmm. this is what this is what we're seeing in your child, and this is um, how we'd like to support them. So coming at that angle, it's not something I've got masses of experience of because obviously parents come to me with their concerns. So for me, it's usually the other way round. Mm -hmm. It can be um, a difficult processing journey for parents to to go on um i think possibly you know like we said because people's views of autism are actually misinformed and incorrect so well, you said you were upset when your daughter got her diagnosis didn't you yeah i suppose for me when so when i first discovered when i read the article and was like oh wow she she ticks all the boxes um i think i felt sad for her i, I didn't want her to struggle i think for you as a parent you always want your child to have um to have an easy life i suppose mm -hmm. and my because she i think because she was struggling so so badly at the time mm -hmm. i was like oh my goodness this means that my child's always going to find life that little bit more tricky um I don't feel like that now. I feel like, wow, she's going to have so many amazing opportunities because we are going to always allow her and support her with that. But you know, we, you know, you know this yourself. There's there's always difficult patches. There's always this big wide world out there that makes life that little bit more tricky. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'm, I'm going to, in terms of the questions here, so sorry, if not everybody maybe got their questions answered, but most, but there's a couple who basically talk to this point of um, if a child is masking as opposed to just kind of trying to fit in, which you said most kids would try and do, what are the things that we might pick up on? Are there any sort of subtle signs that, that might, uh, might identify that, you know, this is a child who's struggling? So I would certainly try and do some um, observations. Um, discrete observations of a child uh, look out for um, very subtle stimming behaviors and I would certainly encourage people to look at um, there's so much good stuff on YouTube around stimming and different types of stimming um, yeah do, doing those those observations but but getting that child if that child is able to get in that child to a safe place so if a parent is coming to you and saying I'm concerned about my child this is what we're seeing at home get in that child a safe place to to talk about that to to unpick some of that mm -hmm. I think you should be doing that whether you suspect autism or not if you've got a parent coming to you you know bearing in mind sometimes these parents are at crisis but before they actually speak out to anybody mm -hmm. You should be straight away saying, right, okay, who, who, who will this child speak to? And it doesn't necessarily have to be 
the SENCO or the mental health worker. It just needs to be who that child feels most safe with and feels um, um, most comfortable with. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground, Jodie. <laughs> is, there anything, is there any question that I haven't asked you or anything that you, you kind of want to say before we wrap up? Oh no, I feel like I should make some big statement now and I haven't got one planned. Go on, um, fire us. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, ah, actually, this is a bit naughty because this isn't mine. Um, this isn't my work, but this book by Dr. Luke Bearden, I recommend this to every single parent that I um, work with, every single family. It's really um, accessible in that it's only of seven pounds something on Amazon and it's so easy to read and it just sums up everything you need to know as a as a parent or, or a teacher um in a really easy to read like the way Luke writes is fantastic so I highly recommend this um and you know if if you are a teacher if you uh, work at a school if you're a TA please just um really try and educate yourself around um, autism and sometimes that means scrapping what you thought you already knew That's and if you're hard. a parent if you're a parent or a teacher be curious be curious <laughs> so if we were going to give people you know one thing to go away and do it would be be curious yeah non-judgmental and curious non-judgmental and curious and give children a safe space to talk about how they find mrs smith really really difficult because of xyz without then being deemed disrespectful or being told off amazing can you talk just for very briefly about kind of what you do um in terms of if people have watched this and gone i want to work with jody she can help me <laughs> how do they find out more about you and what's okay. um so m all of my um, I can't manage too many platforms, so um, my main, uh, the best way to contact with me is my, via my Facebook page, which is Children's Behaviour Support Wiltshire, um, and it's a big blue logo with handprints. Uh, that's the best way to contact me at the moment. Um, I think in order to try and reach as many people as I can, I'm going to continue doing webinars. I'm really enjoying doing the webinars. It means that lots of families can access me without it costing them too much and it means i can access access lots of families um my availability is obviously um limited around my own three children so it's it's a really nice way for me to be able to um share as much as i can with as many people as possible amazing so if people go via your facebook page they'd be able to find out what you're what you're doing yeah or everything i do is posted on there brilliant it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you i think i could talk to you for days <laughs> um, and I'm, we could go on yeah and i'm really um thank you for i know you were really anxious about the idea of of having this chat and i hope it wasn't too horrible <laughs> it was you pookie you're too scary <laughs> <laughs> um no, it's, been, it's been really lovely no it's been no it's been and, and i think that there's so much that you said that's going to be a springboard and a scaffold for kind of further thinking within our community and um, I hope that we can we can talk again and we can take forward some of those ideas depending on what people come back with saying yeah. they find they would find helpful but um, I'm happy to commit now to us taking it offline and looking at booking in a, a live learning session around masking specifically um, yeah. because I think that would be really really valuable um, and, a, and a great thing to do so I will I will talk with you about that once we stop pressing record and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and we'll take that but yeah thank you so much and um, yeah I'll, I'll stop recording now I will stop waffling <laughs> um, and and I really hope everyone found it helpful and um, I guess the final thing I would say is I will share all of your links um, to your Facebook page and Twitter and stuff um, and people who have watched this or listened to it if you would just go give Jody some love because clearly I think that you have so much more expertise uh, and knowledge and stuff about you than perhaps you recognize and it would be really good for people to feedback to you what they found helpful here um, oh thank you it's really kind <laughs> cool. right I'm gonna hit I'm gonna press stop but I'm gonna keep talking to you <laughs> thank you Jodie thank you